Aloha, welcome to Condo Insider. It's Thursday, three o'clock, and this show is all about association living, from homeowners to condos to co-ops, although uh, the laws are different in each of those areas. And we've all heard recently a lot about sustainability. You know, we want to be fossil fuel free in, uh, in I want to say it's 2050, but I forget the exact date the governor said they wanted to be fossil free free. A great, great, great goal. But when it comes to condos, we're getting all these issues about with the widespread now being electric vehicles and what a condo has to do or not do as far as helping an owner who wants an electric vehicle provide a charging station. And so I asked my good friend who's been on the show many times, Nalan Turney, welcome to the show. Thank you, Richard. Always a great pleasure to be here. Aloha, everyone. My name is Nalan. I'm uh, with the law firm Damien Key Leon Kupchak Hastard. I practice condominium law. You make me feel so good when you say it's a pleasure to be <laughs> here, you know. So I know that uh, this is a great show for educational purposes. We appreciate your, your time uh, uh, for doing this. So let's just talk about electric vehicles. First of all, I want to tell everybody out there, I own an electric vehicle. I've owned an electric vehicle for five years. And I would tell you that the perks are great with regard to the free metered parking and airport parking, using the HOV lane. Uh, the perks are great. But more importantly, uh, where I used to pay about 300 bucks a month for gasoline with my photovoltaic system on my house. I now do my entire house and charge my car for $15 a month. That's so awesome. It is awesome. And my car, I, I happen to be uh, lucky I own a Tesla. And uh, I'm not going to give them a commercial, but uh, this is actually my second Tesla. I like the first one so much. But the reality of it is, if you look at all the newspapers, General Motors, Mercedes, mm -hmm. Porsche, Audi, they're all saying they're going to be eliminating a lot of their uh, gas combustion engine cars mm -hmm. and going to try to offer more and more electric vehicles. So it's, it's kind of the wave of the future. Definitely. I've talked to my friends who work in the, you know, auto industry. They are being all seeing, you know, that's EV and also including driverless, you know, those kind of new technology. That's where the future is. Um, it's very exciting. I think also, you know, Hawaii has been, you know, the, I think the number two state, if you look at nationwide, we have, we, you know, as a small state, but we are number two on the chart as far as EV and also our state has adopted the goal to be 100% renewable by the year 2045. Originally, everybody thinks that's a very ambitious goal, but you know, with the years gone by, if you calculate how much um, accomplish we made, I think we're right on track, which is exciting. Yeah, I think you have to put the caveat on that when yes. they say 100% sustainable. I'm not sure by 2045 we'll have solar-powered airplanes doing commercial flights so that it may be there may be pockets of industry that mm -hmm. we're much less dependent on fossil fuel, but uh, it may be around for quite some time to come. Uh, I don't want to crack a joke unless we build a train, I guess, between San Francisco and Hawaii, which was a joke that somebody was talking about recently. But we won't go there with that. Let's talk about condos for a second. Sure. Okay, I buy in a condo. And I own my car. Mm -hmm. It's an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I want, and I have a stall. I own my stall. Yes. And I want electric charging, an EV charger. Where are my rights? So there's a, a statute basically says uh, the associations cannot prohibit any private owner from installing an electric vehicle charging system in his or her own stall. So in your situation, you definitely have the right to go. But the big problem comes to, you know, where if it's a very old building, you know, there's the, the electric uh, infrastructure is very old or your building does not have enough capacity. And then, you know, of course you can, you know, um, place your own charging station, but you need to, you know, you need the wiring, you need the, the hookup, you know, to there is updated electric infrastructure to support that system. Who is going to be paying for that? Because your charger, that's going to be, you know, a, you know, basically your exclu for your exclusive use, that's going to become part of your unit as value to your own property. 
Do you think the other owners would have problem, you know, subsidizing you by paying for those upgrade of the electric system in order for you to play that private system? So it has been the situation is like, of course, you can go ahead do it, but the associations have also have the right to put a reasonable restrictions on how you can put it in. So you will need to maybe be responsible for the cost of, you know, making sure the system is going to be compatible with the building capacity, and if. It's not safe. You need to upgrade the electric infrastructure to make it safe. And how about the electricity you use? Do you, does that get submetered and separately billed? Or I, I can't imagine that the owners who don't have an electric vehicle would have to pay for the electricity of the owner that does have an electric vehicle. The statute makes it clear that you you would need to reimburse the electricity used, you know, for the charger. So you need to pay for the electricity. So let's just hypothetically say that you mm -hmm. have a 100-unit building. Right. And nobody has an electric charger. But now one person wants an electric charger. He says, I will pay for it. I will put it in. Mm -hmm. Here's my company that's going to wirelessly bill my electricity. You know, the association ends up with now they've got to bill the owner for the cost or at least account for it on the owner's ledger. Mm -hmm. There could be some administrative costs for mm -hmm. uh, this hypothetically, say, $10 a month for making sure that they, they got your electricity usage. Mm -hmm. Is all that passed on to the owner as well? You know, I would definitely highly uh, recommend you consult an attorney first. It really depends on, you know, I think in light of the statute, that's probably kind of iffy. I would highly recommend my client to be cautious and, you know, you, you need to interpret that with that statute, also with your project documents and look at the circumstances involved. So you know, I can see if there is a common charger, for example, you know, that's a common amenity. The association has, to, for example, has to invest on a software to see who's in the queue. You know, if you get your chargers read, you can get a text message for the other waiter to come back. For this kind of administrative charges, I think it's reasonable for the association to assess, you know, uh, you know, everybody who's using it as a limited common elements expense. But for a situation where a prior owner is uh, doing that, if there is a submitter, just by looking at the submitter bill, I don't know if you can really charge that. That could be interpreted as a, a charge that's prohibited by that statutory provision we just mentioned. Well, let's take a little step further. Mm -hmm. So you have 100 stalls in the building, and someone looks at the electrical capacity and says, well, you know what, we can handle 10 chargers. Mm -hmm. And so the first 10 people sign up over time, and they re reach their capacity, mm -hmm. and now the 11th person comes to the board and says, well, I'm going to put in my own charger too, mm -hmm. and, but there's only, the board said, we don't have any more capacity, mm -hmm. and then the owner says, yes, you do. All you have to do is spend 250000 to upgrade your electrical room, <laughs> and then I can have the same benefit the other 10 owners have. What do you say to that? Well, and lucky for the 11th person, because right now the system, as the statute provides, it is a risk game. Whoever gets, you know, within the capacity, spend less, and whoever is on the break point, you probably will be held responsible for, you know, the, you know, the expenses. But I've known, you know, there are programs out there providing rebate for private parties or, you know, entities who want to invest on this uh, electric charging system. They will provide some rebate, some help. So maybe that's so, something you can consider. And so I understand your answer. So the eleventh person would have to pay the two hundred and fifty thousand to put the the meter in, or does the board have to pay it? Meaning the association. If it's for a private charger for that person's own use, I would think that's for the eleventh owner to take responsibility. If it's gonna be a common amenity, you know, the association is gonna offer it for every owner to use. Of course, that can be a common expense. Now you're in this industry. Do you see? associations putting in meters and looking at this or is it because of the cost everybody just pushing the can down the road it really depends on what type of project we're talking about you know for relatively newer buildings i know actually uh, you know a lot of projects are looking into this because with um the popularity of electric vehicles uh and you know the technology becoming better you know i think people would view this as a, you know a good amenity to having their project it tends to, uh, you know, enhance values, you know, attract more, you know, tenants for investment properties or, 
definitely, you know, brings value to the project. Uh, people, you know, would look into whether it would be worthwhile for the association to invest on it. But for a lot of older projects where you would have to spend a heck of money to upgrade your electric infrastructure, I think it's a huge challenge. Uh, it's always been, it was a study group formed back in 2015 trying to look at the issue of, uh, you know, installing more charging systems for electric vehicles in multi-unit -dwell, uh, dwellings. Basically, the conclusion which it is, you cannot adopt a cookie cutter you know, approach because each project has its unique challenges and issues for existing uh, buildings is really hard to accomplish. Are there anything within the current laws that would require uh, an existing building Mm -hmm. to mandatorily put in chargers in the guest parking stalls, if any? Only for places of public accommodation. So if you are a place of public accommodation, having um, more than 100 stalls uh, that, that is offered to the general public, then you have to at least have one stall that is you know, exclusive for EV to charge. Uh, have the facility ready, yeah. So hypothetically, a mixed-use building, where there's a restaurant which is open to the public, but the uh -huh. higher floors are residential. Right. And that restaurant, by its governing documents, has 20 stalls available for its customers. Mm -hmm. Would they have to put in electric chargers since it's 20 stalls and that's all they have access to for public? No, because they don't have 100 stalls that's offered to the general public. You only have 20, which is you know below that trigger number. I, I had actually an interesting situation on the island of Kauai up in the North Shore. Right. Where an owner wanted to buy an electric car. And there is no electric um, or charging stations up there. And so the board took the position, well, yeah, you can do that. And we have extra stalls. We will let you put the electric meter there, but you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to pay for putting in the meter. And you need to have, some of the meters have this built-in wireless ability that when you go in, you use it, you're putting your credit card in or whatever, so you can uh, be paying for your utilities as you use it, mm -hmm. right? And so he objected that and said, no, I want to put it in my own stall. And the board said, well, you can do that too, but um, you have to pay for all the costs. Yeah, the, the stall we're offering you is much shorter run, it'll be less, less expensive for you, it would be a lot easier for you to do it here, and uh, it'll solve your need. And he says, no, 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 I think you have to mandatorily put it in for all of us. And then he went on to say, the board went on to say, you know, if you look at Kauai, which is very rural and very much a, a, a tourist destination, mm -hmm. um, the rental car companies don't even offer electric vehicles for use, so it wouldn't make economic sense for us to spend all this money to put it in because most of the people who stay in our condo, it's a resort district, mm -hmm. are absentee owners and or tourists who use rental cars in the parking lot. And so the rental cars don't offer it. They got into a big argument about it, but he eventually gave up. Do you think the association had to put in the uh, meter for him? I mean, if he wants it to be a private, uh, you know, amenity for himself, I don't see why the association would have the obligation to pay for all the costs, especially right. when that amount is so unreasonable. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, this is what the law is today. We're going to take a short one-minute break, and we're going to come back and talk about two bills before the legislature. So we'll be right back in one minute. Aloha and welcome to At the Crossroads. I'm your host, Keisha King. I'm live at five every Wednesday where we have entertaining and educational conversations that are real and relevant, both here in Hawaii and across the globe. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stand Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. 
Welcome back to Condo Insider with my good friend, attorney Nalan, talking about electric vehicles, the wave of the future, as one might say. We just reviewed that an existing condominium has to allow an owner at the owner's expense to put in an electric vehicle charging station for his use and his stall. We've learned that existing laws don't require guest parking to be provided electric vehicle unless you have at least 100 stalls for public accommodation. And so if that one owner and the infrastructure to improve the electrical to get a meter required a two or $300,000 investment, it's all on the owner, not on the condominium board of directors. So uh, the law is recognizing that a lot of our old buildings just don't have the infrastructure to provide an efficient way to provide electric vehicles. So now comes the legislature, who has their own ideas. And there's a bill we want to talk about. I will try to paraphrase this. It was a House Bill number 559. It basically said that all residential multifamily projects, mm -hmm. which mean apartment buildings as well as condominiums, mm -hmm. by January 1, 2020, a simple nine months from now, mm -hmm. That 25% of all their stalls have to be EV ready if you have more than 20 stalls in the building. Yeah, you brought the bad news. I'll tell you the good news is this bill has been deferred, which means it's dead for this session. Well, it shows the, the intent of the legislature. What do you think of the bill in general? I mean, it's definitely, I see there's efforts there trying to really, uh, you know, I, I think promote the, the EV industry. Because uh, I've seen a lot of uh, you know, discussions about you know, the challenge we just talked about. That's exactly what's, uh, I guess, faced by the industry is the, the charging problem. Because there's not enough like, charging stations available uh, for the EV potential buyers and existing users. So, you know, but there's just, a, I think, a lot of reality. The, the, all the challenges, the issues we just uh, discussed about for existing buildings is too hard to accomplish. That's why. Right now, uh, there's another bill, SB 1000. Uh, it talks about for new buildings, there's this push for, you know, as far as by the beginning of 2020, they want, uh, if it's a new multi-dwelling unit building or it's a commercial building, and you, if you want to apply for a permit and you, you have 10 or more parking stalls in that project, then you got to at least have 20% of the stalls uh, basically EV charging ready. So let me just review. Right. HB 559, which died, mm -hmm. said that every multifamily building by January 1, 2020, had to have 25% of all stalls, whether or not you owned an electric vehicle, 25% of all stalls mm -hmm. had to be EV ready, and it died, which is the good news. Yes. So what followed was the identical bill, SB, Senate Bill 1000, mm -hmm. except it said only new buildings that got a building permit after January 1, 2020. Yes. So it would be, for all the existing buildings are carved out, and it's any new existing bill, is that right? Yes, correct. It only applies to new projects who wants to apply for permits, you know, for construction, yes. And where does that bill stand? So that one, uh, it's, it's, it was proposed initially in the Senate, right? So now it has crossed over to the House, and it, it is referred to several committees, like waiting for further review. It's in its second version already. Uh, basically, the current requirement is if you have 10 stalls or more, you need to have at least 20% EV charging ready for new um, multi-dwelling unit buildings or commercial buildings. So the amended version yes. went from 20 stalls to 10 stalls, mm -hmm. meaning it actually made uh, broader. broader. But then they said only 20% of the stalls have to be EV ready, not 25%. Is that right? 20%, 20%. exactly, so yes. The, the new, that's moving. That is moving. And guess who suggested the amendment? Who? <laughs> that's Tesla. <laughs> Well, I, well. I, I, I understand that anybody who makes energy vehicles would have a, an interest. Although, you know, Tesla has always said that, you know, they're about the environment and the future. And 
I think there's some proof to that, you know, because yes. they certainly revolutionized cars, you know, electric cars, you know. People have always said the big problem with electric cars used to be driving distance. You know, my car has a range of 320 miles. I could drive on the whole island twice because you know, we're an island. And I put my char my, my plug it into my wall in my garage every night, and in two hours I'm fully charged because I only do 50, 60 miles a day. So it's a very, for me, it's a very efficient means to uh, get around and a lot cheaper than and my other gas guzzling car I had. Before. I definitely understand. Uh, you know, I also want to protect our environment. You know, when I look at the testimonies, all the supporting testimonies not only comes from the you know EV players, EV charging players, but also all the you know environmental protection uh, NPOs, NGOs. Uh, but you know, we also have kind of concerns. Of course, you know, the developer is going to take into consideration adding to the cost of the building. You know, when you have all these new great features in law, and that means we could have less affordable housing, new projects on island, especially, you know, when you won't be able to get a permit under this law. Yeah, well, that's what the first thing that comes to mind, that this isn't a free lunch. Yes. To put in the infrastructure and the electrical capacity, it's not cheap, it's expensive. So do you end up saying, okay, I have a new building with 100 stalls, I need to make 20%, that's 20 stalls, and so what am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to uh, put in enough infrastructure for those 20 stalls so you can buy an apartment that has an electric stall or doesn't have an electric stall, and that's going to cost more money. But just the basic infrastructure to provide it, whether that mm -hmm. buyer wanted an electric vehicle or not, adds to the cost so the affordable housing model gets more difficult because you have to pass that cost on somewhere and then what do you do if the law changes and they say, okay, no longer is 20%. In five years from now, they say it's 50% of all existing buildings, kind of like House Bill 559 comes back to life five years because we're all in this campaign of, right. of global warning and save the environment. So they build an extra capacity. I, I, now I'm a big electric car fan, yeah. but I'm not sure that that, that bill has the uh, right approach to the, to the issue. Yeah, I mean, maybe the technology is going to be advanced fast enough that it will address the issues that we're facing today. Maybe it will be there will be great charging technology that could be, you know, sufficiently charge an EV like within you know minutes, or that would address the problem. You know, well, uh, it's it's a wave of the future, and I have right. to say that uh, because I've been following this, uh, I bought my first electric car in 2012. Mm -hmm. I've been following this kind of somewhat out of curiosity and interest, really consistently for since 2012, what's going on in technology and what's going on in the world. And it's fascinating. And I think the changing of buyers' habits will, will force this to happen anyway. Exactly. Because if you're a consumer who owns an electric car, you're going to be looking for a condo that will allow you to uh, charge your car versus one that won't allow you to charge your car. So I think we have to rely kind of on market demand sometime to, to create these things. But uh, uh, SB 1000 is a lot. Do you know how many committees it has to go through? I think at least two more. Two more committees. Yes. Wow. Anyway, I want to thank you for being here, bringing us up to date on electric vehicles. To all of you, we hope you learned something about this complex problem. The one thing about condo world, nothing is ever easy. If it would be easy, we'd know all the answers right off the top. But it's very difficult to take existing buildings, people's homes, seniors who live and have to pay the everyday cost, and make these global statements in the legislature that we're going to change the world and make everybody responsible for doing that without realizing someone's got to pay for it. And so maybe the non lon <laughs> revocable, charitable trust will make these donations, or the, but I doubt it. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you all for watching Condo Insider. We'll see you next Thursday, 3 o'clock, for more association living information. Aloha.